Hello everyone! On YouTube you can find several people providing academic advice on a variety of topics such as, for example, how to write papers, how to be successful during your PhD, how to apply for a PhD, etc. So while some of these advices are good and very good, some other ones are not very convincing and even could be damaging for someone's career. So in this video I want to analyze some of these YouTube shorts that I found and provide you my feedback. The first video is titled Why Most PhD Students Struggle. So this is definitely an interesting topic. Let's see. One reason that I've seen a lot of PhD students really struggle, you know, is a lack of plan. So this is definitely a relevant problem. Many students do not have clear objectives and do not really know how to achieve these objectives. But this is why it's so important to work closely with your advisor. I made a video on how to set up your objective based on your next goals. I'm going to link it up there. But in general, it's extremely important to work closely with your advisor in order to define this plan. But let's continue. And what happens is it's often not your fault because what happens is that you start your PhD, you come to your supervisor and you ask like, you know, what should I do first? What's next here? And the supervisor is well, listen, this is not primary school anymore. This is your PhD. So go and figure it out. There's a grain of truth in it, maybe, because, I mean, it is your PhD. You should be able to figure it out as well. But this advice is really a lot of nonsense, to be honest, because clearly there are PhD students and there are supervisors, like your supervisor, who have finished a PhD. Maybe they've published numerous papers. So clearly they know what they're doing. And, you know, you don't expect them to do the work for you, but clearly there should be a plan. So I agree that what the advisor that is mentioning is saying doesn't make much sense. But this style of advising, although it exists in academia, is definitely rare. And the main reason is that by not providing proper guidance, you are delaying the progress of that PhD student. So you are delaying the result of the student. But this also means that you are delaying your own advancement, your own productivity, the results of the project that you are leading. So it's actually extremely inconvenient for advice of themselves do not provide proper advising. So if your advisor is one of these, you may consider change advisor. But in general, I'm pretty sure that is a very rare situation. And I agree that there should be a plan and the plan should be discussed with the advisor. The second video is titled Top 2 Tips for Academic Writing. Let's watch it. Hey, Professor Stuckler here. Today, I want to share with you my top two writing tips. Number one, the one point rule. Each paragraph needs to make one big point. No more, no less. This is a great advice and I give it to all my students. So paragraphs should be self-contained and it should explain one individual concept that you want the reviewer to read. And clearly, this guy knows what he's talking about and my guess is that he has written a lot of successful papers. But let's continue. If you smush too much together, you run the risk of leaving yourself and your readers confused. Point number two, that's called the topic sentence. The first sentence of each paragraph needs to express this one big point that your paragraph's going to make. If you can get these two tips right, you're well on your way to writing with confidence, ease, and feeling smooth in your academic writing. So this is definitely great advice on academic writing. I totally agree and I use these guidelines also in my own papers. The only thing that I can add problem is that you need to realize that reviewers are lazy. So their attention is not uniform across the paper and they are going to jump from paragraph to paragraph, try to understand what is said in that paragraph. And when they realize that they understand what is said in that paragraph, then maybe they can just jump to the next. And with this, if you pack too much stuff in one single paragraph, these things are not clearly explained at the beginning of the paragraph. What can happen is that the reviewer may lose some important things that they had to understand in order to understand the rest of the paper. And this will create confusion and also misunderstanding that they can result in overall a lower evaluation of the paper. So condensating only one individual concept per paragraph and starting the paragraph with the brief explanation of that concept is extremely important. I wouldn't really say it better. The next video is titled Be the Genius They Can't Ignore. So I'm curious. Let's see what they say. The number one thing you've got to remember when you're making a research poster is that you want everyone to think that you are better than them. So I, I, I don't know. There are so many wrong things about this. I also don't understand who is them. But I mean, let's continue and then I'm going to. 
and that is really easy to achieve and I'll show you the tips in this video for making sure people look at your poster and understand that you are an actual genius. So the first thing is don't even bother using your university template. A lot of universities give out the template and they say, oh, use this. But the problem is, if you are making posters like everyone else, how are people meant to know that you're the best? So I really do not agree with many things that are said here. So first off, you do not want to show anybody that you're better than them. Actually, as a student presenting a poster, you are there to learn. You are there to gather feedback, especially from the most senior scientists and researchers. They're going to stop by your poster and you have a chance to explain your research. So the attitude of, of showing them that you are better than them is really not an attitude that will go, get you very far in academia in general. Additionally, not using the template, honestly, I don't think it's going to provide any particular benefit in the quality of the poster that you are designing. Definitely designing a good poster with a good balance of text, images, pointers that can help you explain the concepts, preliminary results, etc. is extremely important. So it's very important to design the poster effectively to stand out and be able to be more clear. But not using the template, honestly, this is not going to do very much. I mean, it can happen sometimes templates are not great and then you need to change them substantially. But this doesn't mean that using another template is going to make your poster any better. And the last video for today is titled Best Tips for PhD Admission. I'm a Gretro graduate studies. As part of my job, I review PhD applications. So I'm very interested in this. Let's see. It is a new PhD admission season. And here is 60 seconds of my very best advice. First, get specific advice from people in your discipline. Very often the best people to do this are letter writers in your discipline. And if you ask them early enough and finish it soon enough, they might even be willing to give you feedback on your statement of purpose. So this is great advice and not just for PhD admission, but in general for your academic career. I always recommend everybody to build a strong network of mentors that can provide you advice and feedback on a variety of topics such as, for example, research papers, research proposals, in this case, PhD admission, etc. So this is really a great advice to keep in mind throughout your entire career. Generally, the three most important questions to answer in a statement of purpose are, why do you want to get a PhD? What kind of research do you want to do? And why is this particular program the best place for you to do it? Often the answer to that last question has to do with specific faculty who are in that department. This is also true. So in a statement of purpose, you should highlight these three things. I want to stress even more the last part, which justifies why you want to come to do PhD exactly in this university and not somewhere else. And so mentioning specific faculty and their research area definitely can make your application stand out. But let's finish the video. Don't stress over any one individual metric. Your GPA, your GRE scores, whether you have publications, these are all just one part of your application and strengths can always make up for weaknesses. So this is true in general, that if you have some part of your application which are weaker, some other parts which are stronger can counterbalance those. However, especially in computer science and computer engineering, we have a high influx of applications because, of course, it's an emerging area that is attracting a lot of interest from students. And at the same time, availability of funding is relatively limited. So in general, we are able to select the best students that have very, very few weaknesses and a lot of strong points. So why it is true that you should not stress too much, I think it's very important that you try to decide that you want to apply for grad school as early as possible and try from that point on to make your future application as strong as possible. But in general, overall, this was a great video. I want to conclude this video by suggesting you to try to understand who the people that are giving advice on the internet or YouTube or some other platform are before just following blindly that advice. Here, I just pulled out the profiles, the Google Scholar profiles of some of the people that we have uh, listened today. I couldn't find one of them, but the other ones are there. And clearly, the people that I like the most are those that are more experienced. They come from great universities, such as University of Colorado Boulder or Bocconi University. One of them even has more than 40,000 citations with an H index more than 100. So they definitely know what they're talking about when it comes to paper writing, PhD advising, PhD admissions, etc. While other people clearly are not in academia anymore, maybe they got a PhD at some point, they did some publications, but they are not as active. And that is not their main job. They are not professors, they are not advisors, they are not doing that actively. So while they can still give great advice 
and then listen to them. You should really understand before who they are and see if their advice makes or doesn't make sense in your situation. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe and see you next time.